Welcome to the Oxford Prostate Clinic's surgical school video to help men get ready for radical prostatectomy. This material is normally covered in a face-to-face -face seminar that we run at the Maggie's Center at the Churchill site. But we've produced this video to help men who are unable to attend due to COVID or indeed some other reason, or who are planning to attend and to give them some idea as to what to expect. This video and the seminar generally is delivered by our excellent prostate cancer nursing team who will be introduced as we progress through the session. Hello and welcome to this online version of Prostate School. I'm Prue, I'm a specialist nurse in theatres and I assist with a lot of the robotic procedures that happen. So we'd normally be hosting you here at the Maggie Centre, but we're filming this so that you're not missing out during the, the COVID restrictions. And um, we hope this is helpful for you. So first of all, I'd like to say welcome to this session. Um, obviously, in normal circumstances, we'd have you come along to a group session, um, but in the COVID restrictions, we're not able to do that. So we hope you find this film useful instead. So the aims of this session are to increase your knowledge about what to expect, manage your expectations, and help you to recover better with all the knowledge that we give you. In normal circumstances, you could obviously ask questions as we go along. If there's anything that you're not sure about once you've watched this, then if you contact the specialist nurse team, um, whose number you'll already have, they will be able to deal with any queries that you've got. So this is our team of surgeons. Uh, you will have had contact with one of them already, at least during this process. Um, it won't necessarily be the one that you've already spoken to that will operate. We work as a pool of surgeons and it will be whichever list has got the first available space that you will be put on to. So before your surgery, you will have a preoperative assessment done. And they will go through if you've got any medications that you're already on, if you bring a sheet along to show those, um, they will go through your fasting instructions, what to do on the day of surgery. And the day before your surgery, or if you're listed from Monday, then on the Friday, if you ring the day case unit, they will be able to tell you what time you need to come in, what time you need to stop eating from, and what you need to bring in with you. And then obviously you arrive at whatever time you've been told. So on the day of surgery, you'll either arrive at the day case unit at the Churchill, either at seven o'clock in the morning or mid morning, depending where you are on the operating list. The surgical team and the anaesthetist will come and see you. And if you haven't already signed a consent form, then you will do that as well. And you'll be given a hospital gown to change into. And if you want to bring a contact number with with you so that we can call whoever you want us to once the surgery is finished. So if you're second on the list, it's also worth make sure you bring in a, a book or something to keep you busy because you will have a slightly longer wait than the first person on the list. So the anaesthetic room, you'll walk round to us um, from day case. It's not very far, but it just helps to keep things a bit more normal and it also helps with your circulation. So a small cannula will be placed into your hand and um, that's for giving medications. Um, it will just go into your vein. And then the anaesthetist will put you off to sleep and then we'll look after everything else after that. So we'll shave your abdomen and also there'll be a patch on your leg, which we that's where the um, plate goes for the circuitry for our, our diathermy machine. Um, we do say if you've got any sort of thoughts of shaving your abdomen to help us out, then please don't. It's much better for infection control if we do it right before the surgery. So just leave all of that to us. And then we'll very carefully position you. The robot's very fussy about what position you're in. So we just make sure you're exactly where we need you to be. So this is the robot itself. Um, the part on the left is what will be attached to you. And then the part on the right is where the surgeon will be operating from. So I stay at your side, looking after the bits that aren't connected to the robot. And then the surgeon will operate the robot arms separate to you. So during the operation, you'll be very steeply head down for a lot of the surgery. 
and at the end you will have six small wounds across your abdomen, five of them small, one of them we make slightly bigger, the one above your belly button, um, and that's just so that we can bring the prostate out at the end of the surgery. So once we've finished the operation, you'll go around to the recovery room, which is still part of the theatre suite. Um, you'll be there for a few hours until you're ready to be moved to the ward. So when you wake up, you will definitely have a catheter going into your bladder. You might have a drain, which is to just take away any fluid that's still in your abdomen. You'll also have an oxygen mask and a blood pressure cuff and a drip that will be helping to replace the fluids you've missed out on while you've been nil by mouth. So there will be a lot of tubes around and that's perfectly normal. You will definitely ache somewhere and you might be a bit disorientated to start with and that's the disorientation is because of the head down position that you've been in and the aching can quite often be somewhere other than where we've been operating just because we've had you in such a fixed unusual position for a certain amount of time. You'll also have compression stockings on your legs as well as Floatron leggings which intermittently inflate and deflate and that's all just to help with your circulation and prevent any clots from forming. So then once you're feeling ready and the staff are happy you'll go up to the urology ward. Um, you'll be able to eat and drink if recovery haven't already given you a drink. Uh, they will carry on with your pain management, which we'll have also been doing up to that point in recovery. And they will have you up and about fairly quickly. So if you're first on the list, then they might have you up in the evening. If you're second on the list, then usually they'll wait until the next morning. Um, but we want you to be progressing so that hopefully you can go home the next afternoon after your surgery. And we suggest that you do 10 laps of the ward. We don't want you to do them quickly. It's not a race, but we do want to know that you're OK to be moving around. So we'll teach you catheter care today, but the ward will also teach you all of that. And they'll give you all the necessary supplies to take home with you. And they'll also give you injections to take home you'll have one a day for 28 days and that's for thinning your blood again to help prevent with any clots forming uh, you'll also be given a sharps box um, the one tip with that is make sure you don't accidentally close it because once they're closed then then never to be opened again if that does happen to you then just ask your gp and they'll be able to give you an extra one and when you get to the end of the injections after your 28 days then take the full box closed to your GP and they'll be able to dispose of it for you. So constipation is your enemy during recovery. Um, it's very much best avoided rather than dealt with when it sets in. So you'll be prescribed laxatives to go home with and we do really encourage you to take those regularly to begin with and wait for your bowels to get back to normal rather than trying to cope without them and then taking them once you find you're constipated. It's really important that you're not straining through the area where we've been operating, so very strongly encourage you to take those. Um, shoulder tip pain is another common complaint after this sort of surgery. It's nothing to do with where we've operated, it's just where the gas that we've used to inflate your abdomen to give us our working space, it's just where any remaining gas will naturally track to. So again, nothing to worry about, but it can take a few days to wear off. So another thing to be aware of. If you need a sick note, then just mention that on the ward to any of the staff and they'll be able to get one of the doctors to write that for you. Um, depending on what sort of job you do, if you do something that's manual involves a lot of lifting and moving around then we'd say you need to be off for longer if you're more office based then you'll probably need less time off but we would still remind you that this is major surgery and we want you to make sure you give yourself time to properly recover so going home as i've said most patients will go home the day after their surgery it's usually mid to late afternoon by the time everything is sorted out for you if you've had lymph nodes removed or if you just aren't quite ready to go home, then you may stay an extra night, but most people are quite keen to escape us. So as I've said, you'll be sent home with your catheter bags, your pain relief, laxatives, your blood thinning injections and your sharps box. So you've got everything that you'll need to help you in those days after your surgery. 
So we can't emphasize this enough. Although you've got small wounds on the outside, it's really important to remember that you've had major surgery on the inside and you need to sort of treat your body with, with respect in relation to that. Painkillers, as with the laxatives, it's much better to take them regularly to begin with rather than waiting for the pain to kick in and then trying to quash it down. Take them regularly and then gently ease off them over those first few days and that, that will work much better. Exercise, we don't want you doing anything too strenuous or straining your abdominal muscles, but we do want you moving around little and often. So walking is very good. Um, certainly every hour we want you to be getting up and moving around a bit it's absolutely fine to be going up and down stairs that that's not a problem and just build up over the the days after your surgery so just to talk a little bit about the diet before the surgery we recommend to try and eat a high um, carbohydrate diet it's a bit like i always think when you're going to run a marathon bulking up on the carbohydrates things like potato pasta those sorts of things to give you that energy to get through the initial days and also to make sure that you eat lots of protein and vitamins because all of these things help with healing which is really important. Uh, Pru has already mentioned that um, you have five um, uh, wounds on your abdomen after the surgery, a slightly larger one just up your belly button. Um, the, um, and just to stress again that this is major surgery so even though you've got small wounds it's major surgery that's gone on inside you'll have dissolvable stitches so you don't have to come back and have them removed and they also use a special skin glue over the top of the wound so that you can shower we don't recommend soaking in a bath for long periods of time but you can shower straight away So Pru mentioned that after the surgery, you'll have a catheter for about seven to 10 days. Um, so the ward will go through this with you before you are discharged home. But I'll go through the catheter and you know, what it looks like and how to care for it with you um, now. So I think one of the key things um, with the catheter, as I say, you'll have it for seven to 10 days. And then what will happen is you'll come back to our Wytham Urology Outpatients Department to have it removed. The key thing when you're dealing with the catheter is to always make sure you wash your hands. So when you're emptying the catheter bag to make sure you wash your hands, that's really important so that you reduce the risk of um, any infection. Um, we advise you to drink lots of fluids. The daily recommended fluid intake is about two litres a day. So make sure you drink plenty of fluids to flush things through the system. When you first come out of theatre, you'll notice in the catheter bag that the urine is quite heavily blood stained. Um, and I usually say that you'll um, expect it to look a bit like a Merlot, then to go to a Rosé and then to a Pinot Grigio. That's the sort of colours that it'll gradually um, go to. And if once it's gone to your Pinot Grigio type colour and then it starts bleeding again, um, that might be because you've just been doing too much, too much exercise. So just slow down a little bit and just keep drinking plenty of fluids that's really important um, there are the odd occasion where you may get a urine infection you've obviously got some you know foreign body if you like in 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 your bladder sitting there in your bladder so it's um if you feel that you've got a temperature that the urine's very offensive smelling cloudy those are the sorts of things that you get with a urine infection so do um, let your gp know and we'll also give you all the contact details for here. Um, we'll, give you, we'll be sending you out a special pack with all the information you could possibly need, plus um, a leaflet that we've written that covers everything in this, um, in this presentation. So um, the TWOC stands for a trial without catheter. And as I've already said, you'll have that for seven to 10 days. Um, often you don't get that appointment to come back before you're discharged, but our outpatient um, team of nurses will contact you a few days before um, for you to come in and have the catheter removed. I think a really key thing to stress is that if um, you have any problems with your catheter, which hopefully you won't do, is to make sure that you contact us here at the hospital. Don't let anybody in the community um, touch your catheter. You've had very specialist surgery, so it's very important, um, no matter how wonderful the district nurses and GPs are, that you actually contact us here um, if you need um, to have anything, you know, if your catheter blocks, for instance, to make sure you come back here. So 
At this point, I'll just go through the catheter care. Ooh. So, um, I don't know if you can see this okay, but this is an actual um, catheter. So, normally, if you were here in, in person, I would be handing this around because some people have never even seen a catheter. So, this sits just inside your bladder and then comes down your leg. And just to show you, people think, how on earth does this stay in the bladder? So, what we do, and you won't know about this because it'll all be put in when you're in theatre, is there's a little balloon, I don't know if you can see that, at the end of the catheter, which holds it into the bladder, okay? And just to reassure you, when we take it out, we do deflate that balloon because a lot of gentlemen get worried about that, okay? So, that's the catheter. And as I say, they'll go through this with you again on the ward, but... Um, the catheter will be attached to this what we call a leg bag, okay, which has some Velcro straps top and bottom for you to um, put around your leg, okay. So you've got your catheter. Sorry, I always um, say when gentlemen here, I feel a bit like an air hostess at this point with all these tubes. But um, so to open the catheter, it's got a little um, sort of um, what do you call it lever at the bottom. So to empty the catheter, wash your hands, can't stress enough how important it is to wash your hands before you do this. And then you just um, open the lever and empty it down the toilet. And then just be sure to push that lever back up like that when you when you finished, okay? So you can see with this bag that it doesn't hold a lot of fluid. So at night time, so you haven't got to keep getting up to empty it or worry about it filling up and, and bursting, you can attach what we call a night bag to the bottom of the catheter and a lot of gentlemen just get a bucket or something and put this in over the end of the side of the bed so just to show you again wash your hands can't stress that enough wash your hands the catheter the night bag goes in the bottom of the the day bag and you just leave that open overnight so the urine drains into the day bag into the night bag and then in the morning you just close the lever off disconnect the bag and then just with some scissors you can empty that down into the toilet and um, and just put it in the normal waste waste bin okay so but as I say the ward team will go through that with you again and when you go home from the ward you will um, be given a little pack with all the bags and everything you could possibly need in it okay so Prue's already touched on this a little bit about returning to normal activity um, we say no driving for two weeks post-surgery and that's DVLA rules you need to be able to do an emergency stop because if you couldn't and you were in an accident um, hopefully that wouldn't happen but if you were then you would be covered um, definitely no cycling um, for um, at least six weeks post-surgery because we don't want to put in any pressure to where they've been done the surgery on the prostate bed and actually also if you're a horse rider no horse riding for six weeks as well returning to work Prue's already touched on that we say no heavy lifting or strenuous exercise for about four weeks after this type of um, surgery so it very much depends on what you do so if you've got a, a desk job you might feel well ready to go back to work after four weeks but if you're in the building trade for instance you might feel that you need a good six weeks off and sometimes longer every, every gentleman's different so you must remember that everybody's very different into how they recover Exercise, I've already said, no heavy lifting or strenuous exercise for four weeks. We don't want you doing anything that's going to really increase that intra-abdominal pressure because you don't want to undo all the good work that's been, been done. And this is just another really key thing to stress that if, and we have had this where um, the odd gentleman might have to be admitted to hospital for, um, for various reasons during the, the post-op recovery period, um, please ensure that they know to contact your surgeon that did your surgery here at the Churchill. Um, you know, usually they're quite good at liaising, but if there's, because it might be something to do with the surgery you've had that they're not familiar with because it's a very specialist area. So um, always make sure the team that are looking after you contact our, our doctors here. 
So just a little bit now about continence. Um, I've already said that you'll have the catheter for seven to 10 days, and then your catheter will be removed. Um, now, one of the main side effects of um, surgery is urinary leakage. Um, so without a doubt, when that catheter first comes out, you will leak urine. There's no two ways about that. And a lot of gentlemen are quite alarmed by that, but it will get better. Um, generally, um, you're likely to be dry at night first, because if you think about it, the law of gravity, you're laid flat. Um, so more likely to get dry at night first. And, and, and generally, one of our surgeons always says, dry at night within six weeks, dry in the day by another six weeks. But again, that depends from gentleman to gentleman. And even actually after quite a few months, even sort of a year after the surgery, some gentlemen still get a little bit of urinary leakage if they cough or they sneeze, what we call stress urinary incontinence. But mostly it can be managed, you know, very well. Um, just to talk a little bit about um, continence products, because there's so much out there. And, and what we recommend is when you first um, have the catheter out is to get some quite heavy duty incontinence pads. And they generally go from level one to four, four being the thickest and that can take the most sort of urinary leakage. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, these look pretty horrific, but some gentlemen actually prefer these, and I kind of call them the pants style pads. So it's like an all in one number um, and with the pad in, and they're just disposable. So some gentlemen actually quite like those for the initial days. Um, and then you can sort of move to there's pads that are this shape that come in different colours. <laughs> um, and then you can kind of move to the lighter pads like that. I always say don't, don't stock up on the heavy duty pads because hopefully you won't be needing many of those. But certainly when you come for your catheter removal, I would suggest bringing at least one pack with you um, so you've got some pads to wear. We'll also give you a few pads to take home as well. I won't mention any brands. You can buy the pads anywhere and sometimes, um, you know, um, chemists own sort of brands are just as good as some of the leading names. Um, another top tip which one of our patients gave us is that um, if you go online, you can register for free um, samples. And um, he said that he got all his family and friends to do the same, and then, then you don't need to even buy any pads. So that's quite a good, uh, <laughs> good tip for you to do that. I've already said about not stocking, uh, uh, overstocking on the heavy duty ones. The other thing I'd just like to show you as well is um, this pack, it's called a um, the surgical pack and if you ring prostate cancer uk um, they will send you one of these um, and in it it has lots of um, samples of different types of incontinence bags uh, pads rather um, some um, disposable bags some wipes so it's quite it's all free so you might as well um, get it you get quite a few pad samples in there um, and it also comes with an information pack, which is what we send out to you anyway. But just a little tip there if you want one of these surgical packs to give Prostate Cancer UK a ring. We do recommend avoiding um, caffeinated, fizzy drinks um, and alcohol. Um, sorry, this is a point where I'm usually not very popular, but all of these things, they irritate the bladder lining. So if you can imagine that you're trying to regain your continence, you don't really want to be putting something into you that's going to potentially make that that worse. Um, we recommend trying to move to lighter pads, so the thinner pads sooner, as, as soon as you can, because it helps you. If you've got a big pad there that's absorbing all the water, all the urine, you might not be inclined to sort of do your pelvic floor exercises, which are really key to regaining your bladder control, which we'll go over with you with you shortly. Do your pelvic floor exercises. I can't stress this enough, and if you can start doing them. Um, before your surgery, and then as soon as the catheter comes out, um, that's our recommendation. Wouldn't advise trying to do them while the catheter's in, because it will probably be quite uncomfortable. But if you have um, time before your surgery, I would recommend starting those now. And, and Tracy, my colleague, will send you the information on pelvic floor exercises. And you can also look on um, Prostate Cancer UK. Um, they've got all the leaflets that we send out on there as well. So after your surgery, catheter comes out seven to 10 days, and then you will receive an appointment to come back in six to eight weeks to see your surgeon. Um, and at that appointment, the surgeon will go through all the results of your surgery with you. 
Um, we ask you to get a blood test, your PSA blood test done a few days before you come back to clinic. So once you get your clinic appointment, just book in with your GP practice nurse to get your blood checked a few days before. And what we want to see that do is to come right down and we say not to get it done too soon after surgery because it will still be artificially elevated so just a few days before you come here. Um, we'll go through pelvic floor exercises with you um, shortly um, but if you are really struggling with your bladder control we can ask the physios to see you individually as well. Um, if you happen to be involved in any clinical trials and I think at present there aren't any trials for surgery may possibly but anyway you might have additional follow-up appointments if that is um, the case in your situation and then um, you can't escape us um, quickly because at the moment and this might change we follow you up for um, uh, ne nearly three years really with um, Certainly for the first year, we see you every um, three months or do telephone consultations. And then if all is well, we go to six monthly follow up. So we keep our eye on you for a long time. And, and just to also talk about the other main side effect of this type of surgery, which is um, erectile dysfunction. Um, and, and just really to say that obviously it's quite a sensitive subject, but do talk to us about it because we're here to help you live with the side effects of the surgery as well. It's one thing curing the cancer, it's another thing helping you to live with the side effects and quality of life is very important. So we don't want you to be shy about talking to us about it and the reason that you get so a number of reasons really but one of the main reasons gentlemen get erectile dysfunction is because around the prostate run each side runs like a path of nerves if you like and those um, those nerves can get damaged um, during surgery so um, there are various things that you can do to kind of help regain that. Obviously, if you've got problems with erectile dysfunction before surgery, we can't give you something back that you haven't already got. So you're more likely to sort of struggle with that a bit more. But um, we have um, a booklet called Prostate Cancer and Your Sex Life. Can I just show that, Tracy? Um, which um, will be sent to you, um, which is a great booklet written by Prostate Cancer UK. And it talks about all the different treatment options for um, erectile dysfunction that are around. And in the back, it has a DVD um, of six different gentlemen talking about their experience of managing erectile dysfunction. So I think that can be very helpful because there's nothing like hearing from the people that have actually gone through it and what they do. But just to um, just mention, there are tablets you can take. Probably most of you have heard of Viagra. Um, there are a group of tablets called PD5s that can help. And generally, they're only effective if you've been able to have some of the nerves spared at the surgery, which the surgeon will go through with you when you come back. There are also, and these look very cumbersome, and we're very aware that a lot of these things that we suggest take away the naturalness and spontaneity of, of um, you know, that side of your life. Um, but there are these things called vacuum devices um, that you can purchase. Unfortunately, the GPs can't um, prescribe them, um, but we'll give you some names of um, some makes um, that will be perhaps the better ones to have a look at. Um, and so these actually basically they inflate, inflate the penis and some gentlemen use these actually afterwards not because they want to have penetrative intercourse but just to kind of help the blood flow come back um, into the penis um, and also there are some schools of thought that think that these can help with um, regaining penile length because after this type of surgery you get some shortening of the, the penis. If you want the erection to be maintained, you have to use one of these constriction bands. So these all come with instructions. You kind of load this over the pump with another connection before actually using the pump. And actually, so for some men, these transform that side of their lives. And then I guess if all of those things fail, and most men reel at the thought of um, us suggesting this, but you can use injections called cavaject injections into the side of the penis. Um, and we have a specialist men's health clinic here at the hospital to support um, gentlemen um, with that. So um, a key message really is just to talk to us about that and don't, don't be embarrassed because it, it's very important. Hi, I'm Deepa. I'm one of the women's and men's health physiotherapists. 
Here I'll be explaining about handling urinary incontinence following your prostate surgery. Talking about pelvic floor exercises, I would like to explain a bit more about the muscles that are involved in helping your urinary incontinence. So that is your pelvis and those are the pelvic floor muscles that stretch from pubic bone in the front and extends to your tailbone at the back. This acts as a sling supporting the pelvic organs. It plays an essential role in bladder and bowel control and also helps in gaining and maintaining erection. In men, pelvic floor muscle is weakened due to various reasons. This includes chronic straining from constipation that can lead to weakening of the pelvic floor muscle. Overweight and heavy lifting can exert excess pressure on your pelvic floor, leading to muscle weakness. In the treatment of prostate cancer or an enlarged prostate, such as surgery to remove the prostate, where some of the muscles responsible for bladder control are removed, leading to pelvic floor muscle weakness. Coughing a lot due to smoking, chronic bronchitis and asthma can also place extra strain on your pelvic floor muscle. It is important to locate and engage the right muscle before you start exercising. You could do this either in sitting, standing or lying down. Try to relax your pelvic floor and try not to tighten your buttocks or your thighs. Tighten your muscle around your back passage as if you're trying to control wind or imagine you're trying to stop urine midflow. You could feel the testicle lift and anus tighten and this is the most important action. Then relax. Try not to tighten any other muscle and also make sure you continue to breathe. These self-check tests help you to identify whether you are engaging the right muscle to do the exercises. Going through the first one, while you are urinating, tighten your pelvic floor as if you are trying to stop midstream. This will help you identify the right muscle. Please do not perform this test quite often as this might cause problem with bladder emptying. The other way of, to know whether you are engaging the right muscle is standing in front of the mirror and tighten your pelvic floor by pretending to stop urine. If your technique is correct, you will see a penis dip and your scrotal lift. The last way to identify you're engaging the right muscle is by feeling the ridge between the scrotum and your back passage and when you tighten the pelvic floor you should feel the muscle lift away from your fingers remember not to tighten any other muscles and keep breathing make sure you have got the technique correct before trying these exercises there are two set of exercises the slow and the quick ones to begin with you could do them in lying down and Progress to sitting and standing when you feel comfortable. Tighten the muscle and hold the contraction for 5 seconds and then relax the muscle. Rest for 5 seconds. Repeat this 5 to 8 times in a set. Please make sure you don't hold your breath while you are exercising. Uh, if you cannot feel let go at the end of the contraction, then hold for a shorter time and relax completely. The other set of exercises are the fast pelvic floor exercises. Repeat the same action as below. Hold the lift for one second and let go. Try and repeat it eight times in a set. Make sure you relax your pelvic floor between each contraction. One of the most important technique is the NAC technique. You may notice that urine leak happens more with movement or physical activity. This technique involves tightening your pelvic floor muscle before you cough, sneeze, bend, lift, getting up from the chair to help you reduce urine leak or avoid leaking. Following this technique, it's a paramount to gain muscle memory that will lead you to instinctive tightening. It's a good idea to start the pelvic floor exercises before surgery and try to establish a good routine. In this way, you will be able to perfect your technique and maximize muscle strength, in which way it is easier for you to continue correctly after your surgery. You can start exercising soon after your catheter is removed. Try not to overdo pelvic floor muscle exercises as they can get tired like any other muscle and can cause muscle fatigue or pain. 
Make sure the muscle is rested completely in sitting or in lying position. You might also notice urine leaking towards the end of the day as your muscles are tired. This should get better with time as the muscle gets stronger. Please ensure that you do not hold your breath while you're doing the pelvic floor exercises. You can download Squeezy app in your iPhone or your Android phone by going into the App Store or the Play Store. You just need to type Squeezy app pelvic floor exercises. The Squeezy app is an NHS approved app and it has a small charge. Squeezy app is a multi award winning app supporting people with their pelvic floor muscle exercise program. You can configure your pelvic floor exercise routine as in how many seconds you would like to hold, the number of repetitions you would like to do and set reminders so that it would keep you on track in performing the exercises regularly. Some men may experience a sudden urge to pass urine and sometimes experience urine leak before reaching the toilet. The best way to overcome this urge is to stay calm as panic make, make things worse. There is a technique called an urge suppression technique where you try to tighten your pelvic floor muscle and hold. Wait calmly until the urge passes and then walk slowly to the toilet. Do not rush as you walk as this could make you more likely to leak urine. This technique may help you gradually but patience is needed as it may take weeks or months before you notice a significant improvement. So this is the leaflet that Prue and I, I wrote um, and it will have all the contact details at the back of anybody you possibly need. So it's got our, our contact numbers in it, the urology ward, it's also got the physio's number as well. Um, so there's lots of support for you if you need it. And then just as extra sources of support, I've already mentioned um, Prostate Cancer UK. They have a wealth of information. They have specialist nurses you can talk to. We've got our fantastic um, Oxford Prostate Cancer Support Group um, that are meeting virtually at the moment during times of COVID, but they are very happy for gentlemen or their partners to ring up and speak to anybody. And here today, we're in the wonderful Maggie's Centre, which is um, a, a great sort of dropping centre for extra patient support. They run lots of courses. Um, you know, obviously things are a bit different at the moment with COVID, but... And then finally, we have our Here for Health department in the hospital. So if anybody's um, struggling with like giving up smoking or trying to lose weight, they ho offer a whole wealth of um, different, um, you know, advice and different programmes um, for you to access. So I think that's it. And normally you would ask any questions. Prue's already said, obviously, you're not here in person to do that today. But um, all I can say is ring us if you need us. Thank you. Thank you for watching our prostatectomy school video brought to you by our excellent specialist prostate cancer nursing and physio team. We very much hope that we will see you in the Maggie Centre soon. But in the meantime, we hope that you have found this video material useful. And as outlined in the video, please do take advantage of the booklets provided by our specialist prostate cancer unit, which should have been sent to you and which contain contact numbers for the department and other useful information. Prostate Cancer UK is another great place to turn to with specialist material, for example, regarding the side effects of prostate cancer treatment, including interviews with patients who have undergone radical prostatectomy and they have a post-treatment information pack that they can send to all patients. Thank you for watching. And also a little tip, if you stand in front of a mirror, this sounds a bit weird, if you stand in front of a mirror and you are doing the pelvic floor exercises correctly, you will see your testicles slightly lift up. Um, one patient said to me once he thinks nuts to guts, so um, you haven't got to get them quite up that high, but it's actually kind of does really help gentlemen to, you know, imagine that kind of movement.